and good afternoon to all of you who have joined us today for this webinar on the topic of a digital euro. My name is Kira Lawler and I'm with the ECB's Directorate General of Communications. I am joined today by Jürgen Schaaf, Advisor at Directorate General Market Infrastructure and Payments here at the ECB, who has very kindly agreed to talk us through the idea of a central bank digital currency. To give you some context to this, in October, the ECB published a report on a digital euro, looking at its opportunities, challenges, as well as its societal implications. At the same time, we launched a public consultation, which was seeking the feedback from a wide variety of stakeholders, and that consultation is still ongoing. So today, Jorgen will talk us through the key points of that report. So if you could just give me a moment, um, I will talk you through the kind of key issues um, in terms of the virtual event. I know by now you're probably all very, very sure how virtual events work, uh, but just give me a moment. You will currently be seeing myself and shortly we're going to be seeing some slides. Just in case you're wondering why you can't see any of the other participants, please don't worry, they are there. It's just a feature of the tool that we're using. So at this point, your microphones and your cameras are switched off, but don't worry, during the Q&A session, they will be turned on and you will have the ability to speak. If you do have any headsets or earphones, I would encourage you to use them during the Q&A session, just because the sound quality is much better. So if you do have any kind of issues or technical problems, I would ask you to contact my lovely colleagues um, in the chat, which should be located in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just be sure to talk to all participants so that we can see your comments. So as mentioned in the invitation, this event is being recorded and the recording, uh, along with the slides, will be made available on the ECB's website after the event. So without any further ado, let me now pass over to Jürgen, who will start his presentation. Jürgen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chiara, and thank you for having me. Now, digitalization is penetrating all areas of our life. Uh, services in particular, industry 4.0 is a catchword, but also payments. What we've seen in the in recent years was that more and more people tend to pay with non-cash means of payments. And now with the pandemic, this trend has accelerated. People like paying more, paying with credit cards, with their mobile phone application. Contactless payments has become very, very popular. So money also, payment and money is going digital. So no surprise that also the central banks are investigating and dealing with the idea of making their money digital. We at the ECB have published a report dealing, asking questions on a couple of scenarios that would make the case for a digital euro more pressing. The report was published in early October we started a public consultation on that report as of the 12th of October. And I will go through you, uh, go through the report um, alongside the following overview. The next slide will show you. I will start with the definition and the main benefits of the digital euro when it comes one day. I will present the advantages of such a digital euro. I will discuss with you, present you what is the current environment for such a central bank digital currency, as we call it, CBDC? We will present you the elements, what makes this a viable product. Um, I will show you that this is supposed to be a complement to private initiatives and not something that substitutes the private sector. I will present you some ideas on what possible types and features of a digital euro could look like. I'm going to explain to you the public consultation uh, and I will share with you some insights about the conceptual work that is undergoing 
and the experimentations that we are doing. And finally, I will give you some insights on the possible way forward. The next slide shows you our key messages, our definition of what a digital euro is actually like. So the key thing is that this is central bank money, different from commercial bank money. I will discuss that in a minute. So it's central bank money. It's made available to citizens and firms. It's going to be digital. And the idea and the objective is that it's used for payments. Now, main elements of this is that the digital euro is supposed to be a complement to cash, not a substitute. So we repeat that over and over again. Cash is not supposed to be abundant. The digital euro, when it comes, would be a complement. We are seeking for synergies with the industry. We are not tending to replace or crowd out the private sector. It's about synergies with banks, with payment service providers, with the providers of applications and the like. The last point here, currently, we do not see a need to introduce a digital euro. It hasn't been necessary so far, but it might be the case that this changes in the future. On the next slide, you see the benefits in a broader sense of such a digital euro. A digital euro could support the ongoing digitalization of the economy that we observe everywhere. So industry 4.0 I mentioned already, um, service sector is going digital and all these things work together, these sectors work together, their interrelationship could be supported and accelerated and improved by a digital euro. Then we do observe a decline in the use of cash. So different from other jurisdictions like in the Scandinavian countries, cash is still a very important means of payment, but we never can be sure how fast an acceleration of the decline in the usage of cash can, can be. In Norway, recent figures showed only 4% of payments are undertaken by cash. Sweden had seen a tremendous decline in the usage of cash. In Europe, also depending on in which country you have a look, uh, cash is still important, but as I said, the trend is going in the direction of less and less cash, more and more cashless means of payments. So at one point, there might be a need for a means of payment that is as accepted as cash, um, depending on the scenarios. Another issue is that there are mounting concerns about the sovereignty of our financial systems, our payment systems in Europe. We observe the growing importance of foreign private digital means of payments, but also possibly public means of payments with the potential of crowding out our domestic currency. So the threat is just a virtual one. It's not materialized, but uh, once we, we better be prepared before such a scenario, such a risk materializes. So the message here clearly is the Euro system, the ECB need to be prepared. The next slide gives you an insight on what others do. So this is a snapshot of the year that phases out. Um, the Federal Reserve System, so our counterpart in the US, the Fed, is working on policy aspects of CBDC, uh, the central bank digital currency. They have a partnership with uh, one of the leading universities, the MIT, to test already several architectures. Uh, likewise, and even more advanced, the People's Bank of China, they have already started to investigate a digital currency uh, six years ago. And they started this year with actual experimentation in a real environment. And so they are actually leading the pack of central banks. Us, the Euro system, we are currently in the phase of active listening. And also this exchange, if you will, is part of this. 
Um, and we are in the public consultation that will end in January 12th. Currently, on the globe, 80% of all central banks are engaging somehow in the work on CBDC. Uh, private projects like Facebook's Libra or Diamond, as it is called now, are thinking of integrating some CBDC solutions in their systems. And also the private sector is investigating and testing in that area more and more. Next slide, please. Now, in order to understand better what this is about, we have a standard explanation, a, dis a distinction along the concept of liabilities, what a CBDC or a digital euro, as we call it here, is about. Now, the most important thing or the most safe asset in this context is the liability of a central bank. So the liability of a central bank would be a claim that you have as a citizen or a company against the central bank. Currently, there are two different materializations of this. First is cash. Cash is a physical form of such a central bank liability, and it's accessible to the general public. So every citizen has access to cash. The central form of a central bank liability is central bank deposits. Normally, banks hold that. A couple of other institutions have that too. There's a limited access. Um, not everybody can have that. A feature is that it is digital, unlike cash. Now, there you see already a digital euro would combine these features. So it would be digital, but it would be accessible by basically everybody. And it would be a complement to the other two forms of central bank liabilities to cash and to, do, and to deposits at the central bank. The other form that we know, the other form of liability is the liability of a private entity. That is commercial bank money. You all know the site deposits with your bank. That is digital money, if you will, but it's with a commercial bank, it's commercial bank money. Then you know e-monies. This is pre-funded electronic means of payments. And the third element here, relatively new, some stable coins. They are also liabilities of a private entity covered often by claims and liabilities by clearly identifiable entities. And the last one, and these assets, if you will, are not liabilities at all, the crypto assets. So the, the most, um, the most known example is Bitcoin. It's not a liability against anybody. So uh, as you probably know, we are quite critical about that. On the next slide, you now see what are the elements that are important if any digital euro, once it would come, need to have in order to make it viable. So there are a couple of areas where we have to reflect and perform. In order to be accepted by the retail client and the merchant, we have to take the end user perspective. So it has to be smooth, functioning, comfortable, easy to use and the like. Then we have to take at one point design decisions. How is this supposed to look like? Then, of course, it has to fulfill the highest standards of legal requirements because, in the end, this is supposed to be a legal tender. So. Uh, it has to be waterproof in terms of its legal uh, composition and definition. Any central bank digital currency issued by a central bank will and would need to be based on a proper, well-functioning back-end infrastructure. Luckily, we have our target services already in place, a huge, large-scale, highly developed um, payment system which we could use but of course a digital euro a payment solution for the retail segment would also come up with a proper front-end solution so how people would use that in order to effectively pay and all this need to be combined via a 
to be developed distribution framework where the digital euro, the commercial bank monies, payment services and the front ends needs to be combined and interlinked. On the next slide, you see what is important to us, and I mentioned this already at the very first slide, um, we want to complement private initiatives. In our view, there should be a coexistence of various means of payments. So to provide the citizens with a choice of various options, what you have already now, so you can choose between cash, you can choose between a debit card, a credit card, you can use one of these cards in order to back your mobile phone payments, you can pay in the uh, internet e-commerce with se uh, payment service providers. So you have very many choices and we want to continue to have that. And we assign a huge importance to the private sector here. One of the reasons why we do that is that we consider now and in the future that the private sector is and will remain more innovative. So we believe that um, the decentralized reflection of private firms' brains will come up with better ideas, new ideas, which can be decentralizedly tested. Some might, may fail, others might succeed. And this ensures the best solution to the citizens. So we believe in the innovative power of the private sector. Us, as a central bank, we do not have the ambition to take up the front end in that respect, in that context. And also, we have no ambition. It's not our aim to take away the deposits from the citizens on our balance sheet. Some fear that there's a, a bank run, an uh, immediate bank run in terms of financial distress or structural disintermediation. It's not our intention to foster or accelerate such a process. And the final element in this context is that we would foresee that the intermediaries, the service providers between the digital euro and the retail users should be offered preferably through institutions that are probably overseen and supervised and uh, part of the European regulation. On the next slide, I can show you the two fundamental types of how a uh, um, digital euro could look like. So these are the basic concepts, the basic distinctions, how it could look like. The first one is an account-based means of payment. That is, you can see here on the slide, two citizens, man and woman, they can exchange their payment, the settlement of which could be done by a central institution, could be done by a, a fast, settlement infrastructure like TIPS that we have already in place. But as you see here, you would have a central institution where the settlement takes place. The other, the other possibility, the other option would be a bearer solution, or sometimes it's called a token solution. So this would mean the transaction and the settlement would take place between two individuals without a central institution or party for the settlement. So this is closer to what you know already from cash, whereas the first one is more something like you have, an, uh, you have a, a transaction from bank account to bank account. So these are the fundamental two versions, forms that you have, but the two could, of course, in reality coexist. On the next slide, some more notions, ideas, how a digital euro could or would look like. So if you imagine how it would look like, it would probably look like any, any other private means of payment that you are familiar with. So the difference wouldn't be too big or noticeable. It would be important that it's available throughout the entire euro area and in the future, at least conceptually, that has to be reflected upon also outside. It has to serve all areas of the population and all areas of the euro area. 
So this is about the need to respect and aim at um, financial inclusion. So the option of having a new electronic means of payment could help those unbanked or underbanked in some areas, in particular young people in some areas of the euro area, to foster financial inclusion. At the same time, this is an important aspect that shows that we have to keep cash. Some of our elderly citizens might be a bit shy of embarking onto a very innovative means of payment like a digital euro. So for them, it is important that we also keep, and that's our promise, to issue cash also for the future. One very important issue is that we have to respect privacy. That's why many people want to stick to cash. So a digital euro has to deal with this issue, the high demand in terms of privacy. At the same time, we have to be aware that regulation is also um, on such a trend that anti-money laundry legislation is there. So there, a balance probably needs to be struck. By definition, a digital euro would be nominally risk-free. It's central bank money, and central bank money is a risk-free asset. So that's very important, and um, it's understood that this feature needs to be there. And last but not least in this context, like cash, a digital euro would be free of charge for its basic use for the payers. On the next slide, you see that in order to come up with a viable solution, we also need to reflect upon potential risks, reflections, concerns that are definitely out there. We cannot deny that there are concerns. They, um, I, I have listed here three, among which are uh, central banking. So what are the consequences for central banking, monetary policy? What would be the consequences for economic and the financial system, the financial stability, and finally the citizens. There are concerns. We have to reflect very carefully, increase the resilience and avoid shortcomings and of course disturbances. We have to reflect very carefully on the design features in order to cater for the before mentioned issues of privacy. There's an issue of whether or not a digital euro would be remunerated in various interest rate environments, for example. It makes a difference if you are in an interest rate environment of 4% or 0% or below 0%. That are aspects that needs to be investigated carefully. And then, of course, there is technology. We have to be very carefully in checking whether a decentralized solution would be superior to a centralized solution how this could look like. And of course, we somehow need to find a solution for offline payments if we want to have the same level of service as cash provides. On the next slide, you see where we are currently, where we are currently in our process. As mentioned, we've started the public consultation in exchange with uh, citizens, with stakeholders, the industries, um, associations, you name it, it will end uh, in January 12th at midnight. And I invite everybody to also fill our questionnaire that is on our website. You will still have another yeah, two and a half weeks or three weeks or so to fill that uh, questionnaire in order to submit your views. For us, it's very important to get the input from the citizens because we want to to know and find out on how the European citizens would like to use a digital euro. It's very important to us. And at the same time, we want to engage with public authorities, uh, industry associations, banks, service payment providers, and market participants, in order to also to reflect on their concerns and see what they are expecting from a fit for purpose solution.
So, yes. Now my screen is dark. There we go. There we go again. So I, while my screen is dark, I, swip, I, I shift to my offline solution, assuming that you can see and hear me. So during that, during that period of the public consultation, um, which is in our understanding a process of active listening, we are also continue to do the conceptual work. So all the reflections that I showed you in a way um, on a high level has to be thought through in more detail, more granularly. And also we have started already, so in parallel to the public consultation with testing and experimenting on potential technical solution. So this is going in parallel and it's the preparation for any decision that has to be taking, taken in the future. So no decision has been taken so far. What we aim at is once we have the results from the public consultation, we're going to assess this, present this to our highest decision-making body, the governing council. The governing council will take a decision by the mid of next year, whether or not to start a project to investigate on the feasibility and also the desirability of a digital euro. So that will also then take some time before a final decision on a viable digital euro will be taken. And for the time being, it's not clear when that decision will be taken, but the objective is to be prepared once the need arises and once the scenarios that uh, I have described at the very beginning tend to materialize, it's very clear there's a lot of lead time required. It's a major logistical endeavor. It's a huge project that needs time and we don't want to be taken by surprise. So there the key message is we need to be prepared and we are working hard to do so. And with that, I would like to stop my monologue now and hand over to Chiara again. And I'm very curious um, to hear your comments and questions. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Jürgen, uh, for that really interesting presentation and for uh, your grace in continuing on um, under pressure of some technical issues on our side. So I'm sure that by now our participants have some questions in mind. And of course, if your organization has already done some research into this issue, please feel free to share that with us as well. Um, we won't be taking any questions in the chat, but if you do have a question, please just raise your electronic hand. Um, the button should be located in the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, it can be very small, so, so just have a look there. And then once you've asked your question, raise your hand, I will call your name and my colleagues will connect you. And then we should be able to hear you and hopefully see you as well. Uh, we would encourage you to turn on your camera if you ask a question. And I would just kindly ask you if you could state the name of your organization before you ask your question. Um, and of course, to lower your electronic hand afterwards. So I will just give you a few minutes uh, to go about raising your electronic hand. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions as well. If you do have issues finding your electronic hand, please talk to my colleagues in the chat and they will be able to help you. I'm sure you must have uh, a question or two after that very um, detailed uh, presentation. So yeah, we very much look forward to hearing from you um, and we're definitely ready to answer any questions you might have. 
Oh, and I see that we do have one question coming in. Um, Martin Schmalzried, um, the floor is yours. Please just give us a couple of seconds to connect you and we should be able to hear you very shortly. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so I'm uh, Martin Schmalzried from uh, Kofasi Families Europe, a uh, family association representing the interests of families and financial services and many other topics. Uh, we obviously don't have uh, an official position on this yet because it's a very fresh topic, but let me just ask a few questions and maybe a comment also uh, thus far. So um, basically, what would be the added value of the digital euro besides the fact that it's risk-free and, and free of charge to use? Because for any of you uh, that have used an ERC-20 issued stablecoin, you can do much more besides payments with it. You can invest, you can trade, you can do plenty of things. You can send it to the other side of the world very easily. You can even create an account without KYC. And so it's just as easy to use. It's maybe just a little bit more expensive, but the technology might actually get rid of uh, the costs. And then the comment is that uh, for the moment, what I suspect is that making sure that all you citizens have a unique verified account with the ECB would make it much easier to send a stimulus uh, like the Fed did uh, to boost consumption. And I'm wondering if that's why you're working so hard on advancing on a CBDC solution. And if you start to openly envisage such a solution, we'd very much like to be part of the conversation because adding yet another tool to micromanage the economy to tick up you know, uh, consumption and all this is not necessarily the way out of the crisis, at least from my understanding. And the MMT school book might not have all the answers um, for you know, using those kind of tools. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for your questions, which I'm happy to try to answer. So the first question of where's the value added? Um, you mentioned yourself that the solution that you had in mind and you, that we, which you are apparently promoting here would be slightly more expensive so definitely as a means of payment it would be a value added to have a central bank digital euro that is first risk-free and in its basic usage free of charge that's a definite and important value added we are convinced of that second the idea and the concept of the digital euro as we are presenting it now in the conceptual phase it's not an investment asset it's a means of payment so we are not trying to attract investors we try to support we try to offer a means of payment of the highest standard it's not supposed to be an investment in the same vein you mentioned monetary policy there are potential reflections on how monetary policy could be applied upon a digital euro. But this is not a monetary policy instrument now. This is a means of payment. We are currently not in an advanced phase discussing, reflecting on uh, inventing new means of monetary policy instruments. The current conceptual investigation, the experimentation, experimentation phase is not about monetary policy. At one point, we have to reflect um, how this fits into the whole universe of uh, or portfolio of instruments and the like, but this is not about monetary policy. Likewise, the question of stimulating is not part of the current uh, reflections. I hope that answered your questions and I'm happy to take more. Thank you very much, uh, Jürgen. And um, we have another few questions uh, coming in here, I can see. So I think we will turn now to Jean-Alex from the BEUC. Um, Jean, if you um, could turn on your camera, that would be great as well, so we could see you, but we should be able to hear you very shortly. Uh, Jean-Alex, you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I can see you now. Thank you. Uh, I am from Berg, the European Consumer Organization. We have already uh, some discussion with the ECB on the subject, so uh, I have a, a lot of uh, questions. Uh, one important point uh, for consumers in the use of cash is uh, anonymity. Uh, do we have some guarantees that uh, the use of cash will be uh, anonymous? 
Uh, second point is about fees. When you say that uh, cash is free of charge, I am sorry, today cash is not at all free of charge. It's more and more expensive for consumers to get access to cash uh, with the new fees on ATM and that kind of thing. So how, how can you guarantee that? Uh, third, uh, in our opinion from Burke, is that the uh, digital euro should be a bearer instrument. That means, like cash, so, uh, uh, electronic monetary unit or token that you can use even when you have an electricity outage. If there is no internet connection, if there is no electricity, uh, if it's a bearer instrument, you can use uh, for cash. That's my three first question. I can have some other, but if you can already answer to this three one, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. The questions are uh, already very meaningful and uh, happy to take them. Anonymity is definitely one of the most important features of cash. And uh, this plays an important role in our investigations. We are fully aware that the demand of citizens is that they ask for a certain level of anonymity. At the same time, we are aware that the trend goes in the direction that the regulation in terms of anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing and the like is on its way. You have regulations on uh, cash payments to banks and the like. So the environment is as it is. We, this is a conceptual challenge. We are happy to take your opinion on board. Um, we have the exchanges with your organization uh, already. So this is a challenge. It's one of the most important issues to find a solution on how to guarantee a certain level of anonymity for the solution of a digital euro. Now, the cost of getting cash that you might get from your banks is the cost that um, an intermediary imposes. It's not the issuer of cash who charges the citizens for that. So the basic usage that we have in mind is providing issuing, issuing a central bank digital currency, um, a digital euro. It's not completed, completely excluded that some intermediary services in between might also add fees for their services. But this, we are not there yet. Our understanding is that for the basic usage of our digital um, euro issued by the ECB, no charge, uh, no fee should be charged. Um, I presented two options of how conceptually a digital euro could look like. One was the account based, one was the bearer or the token. And uh, we are in the investigation of what would be best and um, the combination of both would be possible. So even a bearer solution would not necessarily require to cancel the idea of also or combined having an account-based one. So uh, you mentioned the scenario of an, an, uh, a blackout in, of electricity. So if, if you have a combined solution, so you have an account-based, uh, solution plus a bearer-based solution. If you have an, an, uh, an outage of electricity supply, you could still then use the bearer. And as I mentioned a couple of times today, and our policymakers do so too, it's not foreseen to abandon cash. So the, there are reflections in the technical solutions on how to make sure that even in the absence of electric supply, a bearer solution could work. But as a fallback solution, cash should also still be there. Great. Thank you very much, Jürgen, for that. Um, I think we have another question here from uh, Claudio Zietz. So um, we should be able to connect to you now. Um, and I would encourage you to turn on your camera if you would like to do so. Um, so please bear with us for a moment while we connect you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Claudio Zeitz from the Federation of German Consumer Organizations uh, in Berlin. Um, 
I think there are many uh, interesting potentials for the for, for the digital euro that could, for example, lie in, in more privacy, resilience, financial inclusion, and, and you alluded to all of them. Thank you for this um, very um, uh, good illustration and explanation. Um, but you also pointed out this um, that it's very important um, so far for the ECB to um, include existing solutions, you know, you, you mentioned not crowding out um, private um, solutions and all that. And from our perspective, there there's a strong um, conflict between the two potentially. On the one hand, <clears throat> meeting these non-commercial objectives like financial inclusion, privacy, very low fees, maybe no fees, resilience, you know, adding layers to an existing system, making them less efficient from a commercial perspective. Um, so my question would be, could you perceive adding a new infrastructure beyond existing ones? Because we think digital euro is not just, it's not just an item, you know, but it, 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 from our understanding, it has to be a whole new infrastructure. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that visionary question. Um, the, the challenge and the endeavor that we are currently in is, is a huge one. So I showed you a couple of concepts that potentially provide solutions, options to be combined, to choose. There are many trade-offs. So um, I mentioned, and the, the previous question showed that too, there is a trade-off between the level of anonymity that you want to give to the citizens at the same time you have requirements in terms of regulation so a balance uh, has to be found there it's huge the endeavor and the challenge is huge um, now wherever it is possible we would like to use the infrastructure that is there so infrastructure when i say infrastructure uh, maybe to make that clear um, amid your question, I'm talking about, let's say, the, the settlement infrastructure. So where the money is settled in between banks, that's already there and it's all digital anyway, but it's, it's for wholesale banking, if you will. Now, we are able to use this. We, we have been developing these infrastructures in the last years, make them faster. We have now TIPS that makes payments um, they can be settled within uh, parts of seconds, very cheap, very fast, all around the clock, every day of the year. So the infrastructures, the electronic infrastructures that are there, they have been developed. And of course, we want to take advantage of this. When you now think of infrastructures in a broader sense, so also the, um, the idea of disintermediation, of doing payments without banks, without firms and the like if we would if a central bank would start from scratch now that's an, uh, a vision you could reflect upon but you have to be aware of the enormous challenge that you would have if you if you change an existing ecosystem of how a financial sector a banking system is working so now to replace the whole system as it is would come at very very high cost so in terms of efficiency and also in terms of effectiveness it's probably a better approach to rely on the existing system as it is and to develop it further where the need is be but then also um, try to strive for the highest and best solution that you can find Perfect. Thank you very much, Jürgen, for that. Um, I think we will now go over to uh, Mark Beckman from Positive Money. Um, Mark, just give us a, a couple of moments of while we try to connect you. And then I think after that, we will have a question from Benedicta Ruprecht. Um, so, Mark, please uh, go ahead when you're connected. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can hear you now. Perfect. Um, thanks for the hint. I'm working for Positive Money. 
uh, which is an NGO based in Brussels that is working towards a more fair, sustainable and democratic Eurozone. We think that it is really important for a digital euro to be accessible and safe for all citizens. And more broadly, we think that a digital euro allows opportunities to rethink the financial system from the ground up, as well as to rein in the power of private banks. For example, if you would imagine that, some of that citizens prefer digital, a digital euro over putting their money into private banks, then we feel like this would not necessarily be a bad or disruptive thing because these funds could be landed back by the central bank to commercial banks based on the interest rate. And I'm curious now if you considered in your research these more broad systemic questions and what would be your intuitive response to them. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question, which is also quite visionary, if I may. So. Of course, there is a discussion um, out there in the general public with the NGOs, uh, of which you are a part of, uh, which sometimes comes up with critical questions on the financial system as it is. Um, the critical discussions have accelerated after the financial crisis of 2008 and 9, and that discussion is justified and legitimized. Now, our question within the central bank community being defined as it is being obeying regulations and laws on the highest level within Europe, we don't have that discussion. We have our mandate and we have to provide the solutions and where we see a need to change things within that mandate, within that system, within that environment, we try to improve and where there is a need, we change. Your question, so, so we are not challenging the idea of uh, a bank-based financial system. We are encouraging the political movements that go in the direction of more market instruments in order to finance the European uh, economy. But we are not in the position to come up with a proposal to replace the whole financial system as it is, as, as we know it. and our rationale for providing a potentially new improved solution a digital euro would for the time being within the environment as it is so we are not coming up with proposals to exchange the whole system if that will be the case one day um, because of the political discussions who knows but that's beyond our mandate Thank you, Mark, for your question. Um, we now have another question from uh, Benedicta Ruprecht, um, but she's having, I think, a few technical difficulties, so she sent the question over to me here. So her question is, I mean, she is uh, from, it's Eke Wien, I think, so uh, the Chamber of Labour in, in Austria. And her question is whether it would be possible to use a digital euro without using electronic banking generally so as a normal course of action so would you have to use electronic banking i love that question too uh yeah, it depends um so as i try to show in one of the slides at the beginning or in the in the, in the middle there are two basic conceptual solutions one would be an account based so citizens would have a an account with a central bank there you somehow have to be connected in order to make a settlement, to make that payment. So if um, I want to make a payment to Chiara, um, it has to be from my account to hers. And normally there should be some intermediation in between and the settlement would take place at the central bank. So we, need, we would need to be connected. That's the account-based conceptual solution. The alternative to, to that is the bearer or token solution. So Chiara and I would have devices, maybe the mobile phone, you could think of other tokens as well, and we could exchange the value of that digital euro without being connected. So technically, um, you could think of solutions with Bluetooth or the like, but this, uh, just make that out now, uh, up now out of the blue. But um, such a bearer solution could and should be indeed be possible without being connected, 
without uh, intermediation and without the need of um, access to electricity. And uh, potentially those two conceptual solutions that are distinct, they could also be combined. So you could have both. But um, in any event, the reflections have to take account of a solution that would be possible offline and that would be possible without then a bank. Thanks, uh, Benedicta, for that question. Um, I think uh, we can go back to Jean Alex. I believe uh, that you have another question. Uh, so please bear with us a moment while we connect you. Thank you. Just a, a question to, to complement the question and the answer you have done to Benedict. Uh, physically, where will be uh, located the uh, account? Because you say that uh, it's a, a central bank account, uh, but uh, it's going through uh, an intermediary. Uh, so I guess that the intermediary will be uh, a bank, or uh, or do you imagine any other institution? What what will be the, the infrastructure? How, how it will work in practice? Uh, this uh, uh, account uh, in digital euro. So the the because you you have also the aspect of uh, how as a consumer uh, I transform my uh, my fund that I have in a commercial bank uh, in uh, digital euro, and uh, I think there is also a need of a strong con strong customer authentication. Uh, who will do the strong customer authentication? Just to, to, to elaborate a, a little more on the practical functioning uh, of the account. Again, we are, we are currently in the phase of um, public consultation and in parallel conceptual, conceptual deepening and reflection on potential solutions that need to be tested, that needs to be further, further analyzed. So, all your questions are valid, but there is not yet an answer. In principle, what is clear, um, the account physically, if we have an account-based solution, is at a server with a central bank. You would need probably to have backup systems and the like, but you can also think of decentralized solutions where you wouldn't have to have servers, but that is all under investigation. So the superiority or how to combine decentralized solutions potentially based on distributed ledgers centralized solutions with servers where you put them are they maintained solely by central bank communities are they maintained by intermediaries from the private sectors these are open questions still to be answered so we are not uh, there yet user authentication will be very important by all means but that's then only later to be investigated when we are approaching the testing of potential prototypes. But um, the physical placement um, in the first round of reflections very much depends on whether you we aim at a decentralized solution or a centralized solution. And uh, we are not they're yet to answer that, definitely. Thank you, Jean. Um, I don't believe we have any more questions at the moment, but um, we are coming up to about five to the hour. But if you do have any more questions, we maybe could take one more, um, but please raise your hand now. I think we may have one further question. Um, I think it's from uh, Vini Prandivan. Sorry if uh, I pronounced that wrong, um, but we should try to connect you now. And I think this would be our last question of the day. Hello. Oh, hello, hi. Hi, it's uh, Vini Prandivan. I'm from the Portuguese Consumer Association, DECO. Um, I just want to follow up on Jean's question regarding the role for intermediaries. Uh, it is crucial for consumers to understand what is their design, um, just due to the very significant fact of 
fees that may be charged in that role of intermediaries. So just to make sure that whenever the design is thought of and the further steps that are taken, um, it is necessary to take, take into account that the role of fees and charges that may be uh, put in place by these intermediaries, if it's a decentralized uh, solution, uh, may uh, result in a non so uh, relevant or interesting solution for consumers, per se. Uh, just to give an example, the instant payments solution that has been put in place um, and has been somewhat pushed forward in the digital agenda um, has, in some member states, in Portuguese cases, one of them, uh, resulted in almost a failure uh, for consumers as the prices practiced, put in practice by commercial banks has pushed consumers away from this solution. So that was my uh, idea and my comment. Thank you. A very important question, uh, and uh, it, 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 uh, the, that you pose it basically again shows how important it is indeed. So again, this is a question that needs to be answered properly. We don't have a definite answer now. One basic idea is that these intermediaries from the private sector are supposed to be in competition. So we previously heard that the access to cash is not necessarily free. So there are banks who offer the access to ATMs cost free for their customers. Others charge money, others in remote areas where you have a lot of uh, consumption in, 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 in shopping centers or the like, you have independent providers of cash machines uh, demanding higher fees. So in a competitive environment, the hope is that the best solution to the customer at the lowest potential cost is offered. And within a competition, the best, or if the customer prefers it, the cheapest solution will be offered. Our aim is to make sure that the basic usage will be free of charge in any event. It's to be expected that uh, additional services, which is basically out of the, the remit of a central bank, if someone provides a better service, uh, more features and the like, which are not classically the features that you would provide um, as a central bank, that their services might be charged hopefully in a competing environment and the best can ask for some fees, others can't. So, but we would not interfere with competition, but we want to make sure that the basic usage would definitely be charged uh, free of charge. That, that's the goal, that's the goal. Thank you very much, Renee, for that question. Um, and with that, I think we're one minute of the hour, so I think it's probably time to um, end this webinar. Um, I'd like to thank you very much, Jürgen, for joining us today um, for this discussion on such a fascinating and, and complex topic, as well as all of you for your very valuable contributions and questions. Um, we would really be interested in hearing your feedback from today's event and there should be a short survey which will be posted in the chat. It will only take about two minutes to, to fill in, but we'd be very interested to know about how you feel about this webinar, but also other topics you might like to hear about in future such events. Um, so if you have any other questions in the meantime or you would like to talk to us, you can always do so through our email address, uh, civilsociety at ecb.europa.eu. So we very much look forward to seeing you again at the next event. And thank you all and good afternoon. <laughs>